Good afternoon, beautiful people. Welcome to another episode of Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. This is episode 103, and we're joined by a friend of the pod, I would say, um, the YouTube channel Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. Um, you know him already. His name is Mike Terramad, and he's a libertarian candidate running for president of the United States in 2024. He previously served as a police officer in Broward County for 11 years, from 2010 to 2021, um, as a registered libertarian as well. And he previously ran in Congress as um, a candidate um, in Florida's District 20. And I believe he was on episode 34, the first encounter we had together, then 55 subsequently. And then he was also a part of the first presidential forum hosted by Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. And um, we just want to say welcome back to the show, Mike. And um, we can't wait to have you back on for this great conversation. And I know it's going to be wonderful, just like the previous episodes. Well, thank you. I uh, appreciate, uh, I'm honored to be called a friend of the podcast. Uh, I'm uh, tickled uh, to be characterized as such. I am a groupie. I think you've got a great program and I'm honored to be a part of it and and, and talk with your audience today. No doubt. And um, I tell you, it's always a great conversation with um, Mike. We're going to have about an hour conversation today because we both have time constraints on I know I got things to do and Mike does as well. I have another interview after this one. So um, we're quite busy here, which is always a good thing. But I just want to give a slight ad and just say that thanks to all my listeners, the beautiful people out there that supports Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. Um, we have gotten a few donations recently, and that's not part of the purpose or whatever. If you want to send money to the YouTube channel, that's totally fine with me. We are monetized technically. But um, I'm really more concerned about the ideas being fostered and just growing together as a community. We are an international community with 42% of our viewers watching this show from outside of the United States. And that was always the purpose was to make this an international community. And um, I would also like to add, please support independent media. It's very important. I'm not costing, it doesn't cost you a dime at all to support this channel. I'm simply asking for a subscription for free. You don't even have to agree with everything that we say, but simply um understand the independent minds are there um i try to reach out to different people even though i identify a certain way i go against my own views pretty much all the time but that's the point i love learning from different types of people different ideologies um we're not pigeonholed in a certain ideology on this particular forum even though i have guests that reflect certain ideologies we really talk to everyone and we're truly an independent youtube channel and so i want people to see us as an independent youtube channel and we go outside of the two-party system. Uh, today is a prime example. We have Mike Tamal representing the Libertarian Party. And um, for people who may not know who you are, Mike, could you kind of give them um, an introduction into your view um, of what libertarianism means to you? Sure, thank you. Libertarianism at its core is a philosophy that suggests that the appropriate role of government is limited to protecting our civil liberties. That means uh, a national defense, perhaps, although a, a light touch, uh, a reduced size for national defense. It means a criminal justice system, but one that aligns with our values, our community values, one that is controlled at a decentralized local level. And outside of that, really, the only role of government is to protect your individual liberties. And that is, that is it. We do not believe that it is appropriate for the government to be trying to make so many decisions for us, for us as individuals, for us as families, for us as businesses, to intrude into our economy, to intrude into our relationships, indeed, even with other countries. So we believe in a reduced state, a reduced footprint in size and scope for government at the federal level, at the state level, and even at the, at the local level. But to the extent to which we do need government, we believe that that authority and that power needs to be as decentralized as possible down to the local level. How did I know that you were going to say the word decentralized? <laughs> I really did not expect that to come from you. No, um, just, a, just a joke, audience. We already know. Um, we've had this discussion before with Mike. Um, but it's great because... Um, I still have questions about, and what I'm referring to is a, a book that Mike, 
he has an edited volume of essays or whatever. And Mike is a great part of this. And it's called a gold new deal. The government we will tolerate. And Mike is holding it up there for everyone to see. Um, he's the editor as well. He, and he contributed two chapters. I would say two chapters because one is his chapter. And then the other one, he actually is having a conversation with Lisa. Is that how you use it within your nomenclature or is it L-I-S-A? Do you say Lisa? We call it Lisa. It is an acronym that stands for the Libertarian Intelligence System Application. It is a, an artificial intelligence bot. It is an AI bot that is designed to answer questions the way a libertarian would. The purpose is to spread the ideas of libertarianism, help people understand what the philosophy is all about and what the solutions look like. Inside the Libertarian Party, these ideas are, are pretty you know, bread and butter, but outside of the Libertarian Party and outside of the Liberty community, I believe that these ideas uh, will, can, will uh, take hold, and the AI bot is designed to help us uh, spread that philosophy. And what went behind the technology of this? Is this behind you? Like, is this all your creation? Like, how can you explain a little bit, give the history of Lisa? It's driven by Chat GPT. It is trained by, uh, yes, me and uh, others on our uh, campaign team. Yeah, it is programmed by people on our campaign team, volunteers and paid staff. It's a group project. It gets better every month. It has, it's, it's in beta phase. Uh, so it, you know, periodically comes, it's down at the moment, it comes down uh, periodically for further training and then, and then goes back up. So it's a very fun project. When the nomination process takes place at the end of May inside the Libertarian Party, we want Lisa to be absolutely ready to go for the general election and to, to, to garner and to live up to greater attention. And when was this created again? It's chat GPT driven. Um, and it was uh, developed inside of our uh, campaign team. Wow. That's, it's just amazing because it's a wonder. We've had like three really, I guess, if you count the presidential forum as an, another episode. I don't think this has come up until now. That's the reason why. I brought it up and I was still curious because I was reading. I was like, what? I was like, they have their own intelligence, their artificial intelligence app, which is so cool. I mean, that's very neat. And also, I think a great thing, shout out to Christina Tobin. Uh, I think it's great. The blockchain app that was used, you know, the free equal elections uh, to uh, basically generate a poll to see the, the people be invited onto the stage. I thought that that was a cool concept as well. So. We see the use of it is a cool concept. And of course, we believe that AI is going to play a major role in our economy coming up. It, it has already started to take uh, hold in our economy. But over the next decade, I think you're going to see a, a real strong reformation of our economy generally. I believe a piece of that will run on blockchain technology. And this is one of the reasons why we need to make sure the government doesn't overregulate blockchain technology, particularly in the issuance of a government security uh, currency that would run on blockchain, because we want private sector currencies created on blockchain technology to have a chance to compete. And we want that market to develop in the best way possible for industry and the best way possible for our economy. And we don't want it biased by rules put in place by the government. Yes, um, that word is going to come up quite a bit today. If people have followed the, the YouTube channel, you all know that uh, this is kind of the elephant in the room is um, how do we approach government? Like, what is the view? Everyone has a different view of what government means to them. Um, I know I do. I believe that we need to significantly shrink the government. But the issue is, like, how do we get to that point? And I'm coming even from a different ideological base than Mike is. But that's the cool thing about these conversations, that you learn stuff about people and you realize the commonality that you have in the ideas. Sometimes you have a different way of getting to the same place. Um, but I want to get into the book for sure. 
I want to highlight 10 things and then I'm going to ask a few questions to lead up until these bullet points. Um, the 10 bullet points that I'm referring to in the Gold New Deal, the government we will tolerate, um, just even the title itself is pretty suggestive, if you ask me. But that's not a bad thing, necessarily. Suggestions are not a bad thing. Um, the 10 tenets that are really established in Mike's chapter are pretty much highlighted. Um, and also a Gold New Deal, um, which is a part of Mike Termont's campaign site. If you all go to his official um, presidential site, it's all embedded there for you to see. I'm going to link all the episode um, information there for you to see. Decentralization of authority, preserve individual autonomy, eliminate the IRS, limit federal expenditure, end mandatory investment, end the Federal Reserve System, allow phase out of public education, reform police accountability, end discretionary military interventionism, impose term limits. So these are the 10 bullet points established within the chapter itself. But my question for you is, you use a new deal, that word has a meaning to people because we go to the FDR era automatically, which transposed into another stage of history. But I want to get your idea of like, what is the gold new deal in a simple version for people to understand who may not be introduced to this concept? Sure. The New Deal under Franklin Roosevelt substantially changed the relationship between us and our government. He ushered in a set of legislative actions that required the federal government to play a major role in our lives that it had not played up until then. A major role in terms of regulating our economy, our lives, a major role in providing finance, Social Security came out of this, a, a new Federal Reserve System footprint came out of this, Public Works came out of this, a very different attitude from the government, a very different relationship. Many people recognize that this was not a good idea at the time, but politics uh, being what they are, they were able to, to take hold politically we recognized in the 60s and in the uh, 70s that many of these programs are going in the wrong direction. And now it's been uh, 90 years since the New Deal came into place. And we know that many of these programs do not help the American economy, do not help the American family in any of the ways that FDR had uh, intended. Good intentions notwithstanding, we need to change this. We need to roll this back. And so we call it a gold new deal. Yeah, we're poking a little fun of the green new deal. Obviously, the green new deal was uh, an attempted change in the Democratic Party uh, to double down on the new deal and to institute new regulation and legislation based on prioritizing the economy uh, behind the prioritization of, of, of the environment and prioritizing the family after the prioritization of the environment. We believe that those are the wrong ways to go, that we need to prioritize business, the economy, and most importantly, our families ahead of government. So we believe it requires a new relationship. This is what we call a gold new deal, gold being the color of the uh, Libertarian Party, and harkens back to a time when our currency was not merely fiat currency controlled by the government when it was actually backed up by gold. We believe that a different type of relationship would be good for us culturally, good for us economically, and good for the American family. And that's what we're talking about here. Um, I've never asked you this question before, Mike, but you wouldn't consider yourself an anarchist, right? I would consider myself a minarchist in the sense that I believe in minimal government. I think that there, there are valuable things that we can do with government if we can keep it under control. It's very difficult to keep it under control. As a minarchist, I can imagine... Uh, a government being effective in providing national defense, 
I can believe that a government can be effective in providing, for example, a criminal justice system. So I, I don't advocate a complete elimination of the government, but I, I do believe that the government should be limited to whatever it takes to protect our civil liberties. And really, that's about it. Yeah, that's exactly what you said. Um, I highlighted it in my notes because it kind of raised, um, you know, some caution. Because you said, I definitely got that just to tie those up, the government we will tolerate, which is suggesting that you don't, you're not a fan of government as it is. I mean, clearly by the title, but you also seem to acknowledge that we need to have some sort of an infrastructure. I guess that would be um, the government's role is to protect liberty is what you established. Um, I noticed that you said to protect liberty. Um, in what sense um, would the government be able to protect liberty? In a, in a national defense sense, in a criminal justice sense, and from itself. You know, the reason the Constitution was developed was to limit the role, limit the power of government, and at the same time establish that the federal government could protect our civil liberties uh, from state and local governments that might encroach upon them. And so I think it's very important that a federal government can have a role to play in protecting our civil liberties from state governments when state governments, uh, you know, do dumb things just like the federal government can. But really, that's about it. I don't think it's a good idea. Empirically speaking, objectively speaking, we have a long history of understanding that it's not a good idea for our economy for the government to be playing a major role. When government tries to guide the economy through industrial policy, through taxes, through tariffs, through incentives, uh, through bailouts, uh, through subsidies, it makes the economy less efficient and keeps our economy from developing in the most efficient way possible. It's a compromise, I realize, because politicians believe that for political reasons, there are you know valuable things to be done even if it means slowing down the rate of growth of our economy and of our income. But these are just the kinds of things that we need to keep politicians from doing. Before we get into um, the 10 bullet points that I established before, and some we may emphasize more than other ones, because I think um, some are pretty clear in the intentions and kind of like we've explained it before, but um I'll let you also emphasize what you want to emphasize, too, in case you feel like we haven't covered enough, because I know on one episode you said, you know, you could really get into police reform. And I think we didn't do that because we've talked so much about police reform on the show. But um, I definitely want to give you an opportunity if you have a unique standpoint when it comes to, you know, what you would provide as far as um, police reform and what's your vision of that. But. As far as the Constitution is concerned, what is your overall view of the Constitution? Like, we haven't talked about this a lot, like me and you especially, and other libertarians, but you especially, what do you view, do you view the Constitution as something that's like, I don't want to say sacred, but is it something that we should kind of go back to? Should we follow the Constitution pretty much in lockstep? I believe that we absolutely must follow the Constitution. Uh, there's no question the United States of America today is a post-constitutional nation. We don't adhere to the Constitution in any serious uh, fashion. If you were to read the Constitution today and compare it to what our government looks like, I think you would be hard-pressed to even imagine that this is a, a government that grew out of the Constitution that was originally uh, developed. The, the problems that we have in America, most Americans are waking up to this idea. Many of the problems that we have today in America are the result of bad public policy. And those bad public policies have grown out of the government taking too much authority to itself, too much power, playing too much of a role in our lives. If we were to return to the intent, maybe not even go all the way back to the intent of the Constitution, just go back to the, to the writing of the Constitution, 
we would be better off economically. Our incomes would be substantially higher. Uh, our lives would be less corrupted by government policy. Local governments would have a greater latitude to pursue their own political futures. People would play a greater role in developing public policy at the local level than they do now. And so in this sense, governance would be more effective. It would have a lighter touch and it would allow uh, for more effective development of uh, our culture as well as, as well as our economy. So yes, absolutely, I believe that we should be adhering to the constitution. To the extent to which we believe that the original constitution uh, fell short, yes, there is a, a process in place to amend the constitution. But the constitution, even amended, is not something that our current government follows in any significant way. Uh, most government policy, almost all regulatory policy, is just not adherent to the spirit or the law of the Constitution. Yeah, and the scope of the government is just, um, there's there's no comparison. Um, as, as far as just the size of government, it has consistently grown um, ever since it was started, you know. Um, and that's inevitable. Like, the government is going to grow um, with, with the population growing the way it did, but um, we can. I think we can all agree here um, together, um, the audience that that the government is, is is definitely in a position where there's just too much um, control. I mean, that may not even be strong enough of a word. I mean, in some of these situations, just um, every president. It seems like in my lifetime, I know for a fact every president in my lifetime, even not knowing when I first got into politics, has contributed to this. Um, dangerous um, overreach of power, um, whether it's the Patriot Act, um, just any sort of laws that seems like it's only there to benefit and strengthen like the government, but not in a way to benefit people at all. Like it's it's the opposite of what you were saying. It's not protecting liberty. It's, it's anti-liberty. It's anti-libertarian. The government is now. And um even my dad, he came onto the show, and a lot of my influence comes from my dad. But um, he said himself that maybe the government had great intentions when it first started out, but it's clear that it's only gotten worse and just restricted people's liberties more and more throughout the decades. And um, I think most people can agree with that. The issue, I think, just reading this isn't from myself because I understand politics a lot more than the average person probably. But I think the average person reading this book, for instance, would have issues, I think, just um, with the language because they have to maybe deprogram what they've accustomed to like hearing when they hear the word government, what, what they thought of as the government when they were growing up, maybe if you're a baby boomer, you may have a completely different view of what government means to you versus someone that's a Gen Zer. And I think that's part of the issue. How do we get people universally um, in line to understand that the government is a problem? Because you have people in completely different times that remember the good old days when you could buy a car, you could save money, you could get interest on your savings account. But people at this day and time don't have that kind of concept. Well, you're absolutely right. Your dad may be uh, closer to my generation uh, than than I am to yours. It is true. And, and I would say uh, there might have been a dividing line with the uh, assassination of President Kennedy and then a dividing line uh, with the resignation of Richard Nixon. During that 11-year uh, period, I think that there was an acceleration of the extent to which Americans are waking up to the idea that things were different than what we had thought, right? The previous gener, this is when I was a small child, but you know, my parents' generation, I think, grew up believing that the government uh, was a reflection of American values that stood up for American values, that there was in some sense a, a lockstep uh, simpatico between Americans and, and their government. 
in your generation, I think, is uh, quite wide open, clear-eyed about the fact that this is not the case. And I think that it's important that when we speak to folks who, you know, certainly a generation ahead of me, but you're right, uh, Gen X, for example, people that grew up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s even, it's important that we remember that they grew up without the same skepticism that we have today. There was a certain optimism that we need to be sensitive to that people are giving up on, right? Mm -hmm. And there is a transition there. Whereas youngsters grew up without the pretense of an automatic faith or trust in government, mistrusting government from the get-go. And I think while I would never suggest that cynicism is healthy, I do believe that it is a healthier outlook on government today because it is more realistic. That the government that we have, especially at the federal level, the government that we have is controlled by people who are in it for their own power, who have a set of values that does not align with your values, my values, or most Americans' values. They conduct policy in order to keep themselves in power. And I think you need to go no further than to look at each of the duopolistic powers that are in place today represented by the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. The number one priority of the Democratic Party is not what it used to be. It is not anti-war standing up for civil liberties. It is not standing up for the First Amendment standing up for the Fourth Amendment. No, the priority of the Democratic Party is to keep Republicans out of power. And the priority of the Republican Party is to keep Democrats out of power. The Republican Party is no longer one that is adherent to the values that it used to espouse in the 80s, 90s, and even the first decade of this century. Fiscal conservatism, for example. Uh, free trade, for example. Uh, a welcoming, deregulated environment for businesses and income to grow. These are things that have gone by the wayside. And so we need to remember that a lot of folks joined those parties in times past with good intentions, thinking that their values would be represented by these parties. It is not Americans who have changed. It is these parties that have changed. Democrats in that party have gone in two different directions, and Republicans in that party have gone in two different directions. And now what you have is, realistically speaking, the Libertarian Party, my party, the party that is, after all, the philosophical descendant of the people that put our Constitution together, that wrote the Declaration of Independence, that created our federal government for the sole legitimate purpose of protecting our civil liberties. The Libertarian Party now represents American values in a way that the other parties that are in power simply do not. And this is why I say as often as possible, voting third party is not a wasted vote, but is really the only way left to align your vote with your values. If you vote for a par any party, that does not represent your values. You're wasting your vote. You're signaling to that party that that party does represent your value. You're lying, right? You're sending a miss signal. If you believe in fiscal conservatism, for example, or free trade, and you vote for a Republican because of that, you're sending the signal that you believe those folks are on the right track. And they're not. And so not only have you wasted your vote in the sense that you've missed an opportunity to send a signal, but you've reinforced a party whose number one objective is merely to keep Democrats out of power and vice versa. And so in that sense, I think it is uh, absolutely critical that we rethink American politics. And that is, I believe, what 2024 is all about. Yes. And um I just I wish that the psyche of the country was in a different situation because um, it's clear that people aren't voting based on their own principles. Um, and it's hard to teach someone how to do that. But um, my suggestion for people would be think about a tabula rasa. 
just get a go home wherever you are right now, get a blank sheet of paper and you write down, even if it's hard to do, try to do it. Coming up with 10 things that are the most important thing to you that you look for in a leader, 10 of the most important things. And I guarantee you, if you follow those 10 things, it won't be reflected by the two parties at all. Like it won't be, it just, it doesn't make sense. Because like Mike was saying, the intention of the two parties is to basically keep each other out of power, which I, I believe that they're the same party. I would argue that they're the same party because if you need each other to survive, you're basically one unit at that point. You just have two wings of the same animal. And um, it's I think people are starting to see that, but then they fall back to like, oh, I got to support one side or the other. And that's the deprogramming that we have to have in place, um, you already have Republicans strategizing whether their candidate wins or not. How are we going to change the party in 2028? And and to me, what does that have to do with principles? It has nothing to do with principles. It's simply a strategy at that point to look in the future. Oh, how are we going to keep control? How are we going to keep power? And And people who are listening to this, think about your own principles and worry less about what the parties are doing for strategy. And um, that would be my advice to the audience because I know a lot of friends that I can't tell them how to vote or anything if you believe in this process, but that would be my advice is to think about what you want as opposed to what the parties are trying to tell you or they're trying to sell to you. I think that that's excellent advice. Indeed, I think it's worth going one step further. I think it is the obligation of every individual American to vote for his or her particular particular set of values, to vote for a politician that represents those values. If you don't, if you send the signal that one of those other parties, whoever it may be, does align with your values when they actually don't, you're contributing to extending a problem that you have an opportunity to stop, to fix, to rectify, to straighten out, to reform. And you're contributing to blocking that reform. It's worse than wasting your vote. You're lying. You're being dishonest. If you vote honestly and send the signal, this particular candidate represents my values, this party, represents my values, then that party will grow, will get the signal and represent those values. But if you send the signal to a different party that does not, they will think they're on the right track and continue to garner power. And in this sense, I think you're letting down not only your own values, letting down yourself, but you're also letting down fellow Americans. Remember that your values probably align better with most other Americans than they do with the political parties. And so when you rob some party of a vote because that party doesn't align with your values and you do vote for a different party that does, you're actually doing a favor to your fellow Americans. But if you vote for a party that does not align with your values, you're voting for a set of politicians that don't give a damn about your values. The Republican and Democratic parties, let's be honest, they are run by a set of elites who believe in different policies than you would put in place if you were in power. They believe in a big militarily hegemonic Defense Department that projects power around the world for the sake of itself, for the sake of control. This does not align with your values. This is not what you would do if you were running the foreign policy of the United States. Why would you vote for someone who thinks that that is a good idea? And by the way, I think most Americans are also waking up to the idea that American foreign policy has been an abject failure empirically, objectively speaking. Set your ethics and your values aside just based on success. The Defense Department of the federal government of the United States of America has been a complete and total failure. There are no examples that Americans would point to and say, 
oh, that was worth it. It cost us billions of dollars. It cost us thousands of lives, but it was worth it. There's no such example. And by the way, in the case of Afghanistan and Iraq, sadly, we're not talking about billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. We're talking about trillions. And even more sadly, we are not talking about the loss of thousands of lives. We're talking about the loss of over a million lives. This is not something that you would support, that you would do if you were in power. Why would you continue to vote for people who promise to continue doing it over and over again into the future? Well said, definitely. And um, that was a perfect point because um, the audience is probably wondering, like, are you going to get to the book, Kiko? <laughs> I will. So I'm going to say this last 20 minutes. I just like having the conversation. I don't want to be just all questions. Uh, my interview style is, is maybe different than other, you know, people that you're accustomed to. But it's, it's more conversational. And I think it's more people get more from those types of um, exchanges as opposed to just direct questions or even just the, the banter um, back and forth. We don't really do that here. Um, but the last 20 minutes I want to save to um, the 10 uh, points established in my chapter. And I want to ask him, out of the 10 that you um, present here, the decentralization, the limited federal expenditure, everything that I've discussed, which one of the 10 do you think is the easiest to attain right away? That is a great and very difficult uh, question. There are some that we can work on just by no longer doing the stupid things that, that we do at the federal government level already. For example, the idea of preserving individual autonomy. If we would stop the government from encroaching on our lives in terms of mandating that we take a vaccine, mandating that businesses be shut down in the midst of a virus, mandating that people wear masks, being dishonest with us regarding data on a vaccine, being dishonest with us about how the vaccine was developed, take away the free lunch that we give in terms of protection from liability to the developers of the vaccine, undermining the way that courts should work to hold companies accountable. If we would just be more open and honest and stop with the personal regulation of people's lives, the next time that we have a, a disease or any other weird thing happening in our nation, that would go a long ways. By the way, that includes businesses getting out of uh, the idea of bailing out banks, bailing out corporations. We also need to change the way that uh, we allow the federal government to raise money. One of the big tenants is ending the IRS and forcing the federal government to go to state legislatures to get money, not to individuals. That is a wholly inappropriate uh, relationship. We also need to cap how much money we allow the federal government to spend, as well as state and local governments. This is a, a an extremely important point. It is not enough to say we want a balanced budget. A balanced budget means the federal government can just tax you more to balance the budget and continue to spend all at once. We need to remember that however the government raises money through taxes, through inflation by just printing money or by debt that we pass on to future generations. However, the government raises money, every dollar the government spends is robbed from you. It is robbed from the private sector, it is robbed from individuals and families and businesses. That's why we need to cap spending, not just require a balanced budget. So each one of these has an important role to play in changing the relationship between us and government. At the same time, we need to change the relationship between the federal government and state governments. We need to give state governments a constitutional vehicle to opt out of federal supremacy and allow state governments to chart their own political futures. It is not 
something that had been envisioned when our federal government was put together, that the federal government would continue to boss around state governments the way that it has. It's completely inappropriate. We need states where individuals have more control than at the federal government level. We need state governments to be able to make up their own mind. And so I believe that we need a way for state governments to opt out of federal supremacy and to opt into a nullification of federal law and federal regulation when there's a discrepancy between that and state law and to resolve those conflicts in state court. This is essential to changing the relationship between us and, and government. Yes, absolutely. There's just so much to you said that, especially towards the end about the state versus the federal. And we talked about this, I think on um, episode 34, uh, my first encounter about this, um, the issue of decentralization, but that doesn't take away the mechanism of abuse, regardless of how, if, if it's local abuse is still the same as federal abuse, is the same as state abuse. No one can control who's in charge. That abuse can still exist regardless of how localized it is or how nationalized it is. You're and that's exactly the right. We have to face. You are exactly right. And we learned this the hard way during the COVID regime, where in many states, the regulatory environment was horrific compared to other states, right? No state was a good environment to live in. But there were certainly states that were uh, much worse than others. So we learned that there is a tremendous amount of difference that that state governments can make. We also spend a lot of time talking, as you and I have, about police reform. And one of the things that that we need to talk more about as a nation is school reform, that we need to get the government out of education. We need to allow public education to phase out under competition with private schools offering educational services at the primary and secondary uh, education level. That starts out with school choice programs that we're all gratified to see are finally taking hold. They're allowing greater competition, allowing for better educational opportunities, allowing families to better align their own values with their kids' education. Over time, I don't know how long this will take. It's absolutely more than 10 years, but I believe it's a lot less than 50 years. Public education will largely phase out in the United States, and I believe that's exactly what we want. We would not tolerate the government dominating another industry why would we allow the government to dominate an industry which is so important, arguably the most important industry in the United States, the education of our kids? So that is, you know, police reform and education reform are two more planks in what I believe the Gold New Deal represents, a new relationship between us and government. And then, of course, we wrap up with talking about term limits. As a libertarian, I've never liked the idea of term limits. The idea of limiting your choice, wow, that's not at its core a libertarian idea. You should be allowed to vote for whatever nincompoop you want. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is that while term limits may be a bad idea, it is a bad idea whose time has come. That there is just no other way to limit the power that these individuals in government have learned to develop for themselves. They have abused the authority of incumbency to create unfair advantages. And those unfair advantages have created a system in which it is extremely difficult to hold them accountable. And for this reason, I believe that we need term limits as a hard stop on these individuals' ability to keep accelerating the development of their own personal power. I'll, I'm just listening to you like discuss these things like, you clearly have a vision of, of what you understand in, in an effective government, the way it should be um, approached. As I'm not gonna get into the ideological back and forth because it's clear that like for me, I guess where you and I would differ significantly is that for instance, education, I think I see education as an essential. 
Um, all I know is public education. Like it served me very well, but I can understand how some people like it wouldn't serve them well at all. And a lot of this is um, it has to do with just other societal factors. Um, I talked to Chase Oliver about that, um, one of your fellow libertarians, about how um, you know, before a kid even goes to the classroom, they're confronting other issues before they come in because everyone's zip code is different. And it's not the same for every student going into the classroom. And that those circumstances outside of the classroom significantly affect if they're going to have a great education or not, because they're not even set up to have a good education if your environment outside of the school isn't even a good environment. And so a lot of this, I don't even know if, if it's just strictly the education system itself that's an issue, because there's so many other issues that intertwine with the educational ills. Of um, course. Mm -hmm. uh, our families are struggling under all kinds of challenges and issues. But have you ever attended a private school? I've never attended a private school. Okay. Why would you assume, why would anyone assume that it's a good idea for the government to be involved in any industry? Oh, you're asking me the question. I... It, it has to do with what we were saying before. It has to do, I'm a Gen Xer. And um, I kind of preface that question, not to be personal, but I'm definitely on the cusp of the crossroads. Like I kind of understand what my parents envisioned when they were growing up in this world. And I would say that my education experiences were more reflective of what they went through versus what my kids go through right now, for instance. Like just the way things are taught in school and everything. Um, I can honestly say that I've had just great positive experiences in my public education. But again, I can only speak for myself. Um, I personally had good experiences in my public education. But if I told you that the government was going to run all of the ice cream shops in your town and you only had that choice, there was no other ice cream shop you could go to because the government was providing the ice cream for free. And so it ran out all of the other ice cream shops. They didn't exist in your town. And you went to one of those ice cream shops and you got an ice cream cone and it was pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. Your experience was good. Mm -hmm. Would you suggest to me that it was a good idea to have the government running the ice cream shops? That I think that's where I think that there's no issue with that. I think that there should be some privatization. Absolutely. I don't believe in absolute. Um, I think the option should be there. If you want to go to a private school, you should absolutely have that right to do it. But I think that for me, like my vision would be the government should take care of very specific things. But the issue is that the government doesn't do those things for whatever reason. Well, Kiko, do you think the government should run ice cream shops? No, no, no. I don't think so, personally. Do you think it should run grocery stores? Well, it it, it doesn't. Like, I, I get the point you're making, but at the same time... Should they... the government run grocery stores? This is an important question. Grocery stores are arguably more important than schools. Mm -hmm. Should the it... government run grocery stores? Is it really? It depends on like the government that you have. I mean, that's the thing about it. I, 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 let I like me it. help you out. Let me let me help you out. Absolutely not. There is absolutely no economic reason. There is absolutely no philosophical reason. There is no business reason. There is no business model. There is no industrial model that suggests that the government would have any advantage but would be subject to many disadvantages in running any industry. There is no reason why the importance of an industry suggests that it should lean toward public dominance. In fact, if all you cared about was the quality of the product, then that would suggest you want less public dominance, not more public dominance. If all you cared about was the quality of the product. Now you said 
that you believe that you should have the right to go to a private school if you want to. Okay, in most communities, you don't have that right. The government has taken it away from you. The government has taken it away from you because the government taxes, property taxes, right? For the most part, those property taxes, as well as some other taxes, that revenue is used to fund the public schools and provided to families at no cost. Private schools in most places don't even exist as a practical matter, but to the extent to which they do, they cannot compete in any real sense because they don't have access to the public funding. Mm -hmm. So families are faced with a choice. They can either go to the no cost to them, price equals zero public school, or they can go to a private school that they just can't afford. There's no real choice in that sense. It is a choice that's been completely biased and thereby eradicated for all but the wealthiest families. And so the government has effectively taken away your right to attend a private school. In most communities, there is no private school because the private schools cannot compete because they don't have access to public funding. This, I believe, is not just a, an industrial organization problem that results in a bad product. This is a human rights issue. Most mm -hmm. bad neighborhoods in the United States do not have a private school for this reason. Whereas if the public funding that is used to pay teachers in public schools, to pay for facilities of public schools and the administration of public schools, if that public funding were made available on a competitive basis to private schools, I guarantee you your local archdiocese, your local Lutheran church, your local educational entrepreneurs, they would make damn sure that there is a private school option available to every community in which there is a public school option. But that's not the case today. Thankfully, school choice programs are on the march. They are increasing mm -hmm. and getting good results. But this will not be uh, an issue resolved until every family has available to itself on a competitive basis, on an even playing field without government biases in terms of cost and prices until they have an option of a private school and a public school. And then we'll see what happens to the public school uh, population. It will dwindle, whether it dwindles uh, below some threshold of sustainability, we'll see. I predict that it will. And I, I predict that eventually in most places, public schools will completely go away. And then we'll move on to the next debate about how we want to finance schools in the primary and secondary levels. And I believe eventually we'll get out of the business of uh, public finance for education, but that's the next step. I can honestly say that our conversations definitely made me think about, you know, the future. And it makes me reassess, you know, certain views that I've previously held, but I've always been like that. I'm kind of, you know, constantly learning. You, you understand things, but I will respond to like what we were talking about earlier. And I'll conclude just um, as far as the 10 points that you, have make, you make in your chapter, that I believe four through six, three through six, are almost impossible to obtain at this point and probably will be within our lifetimes, eliminating the IRS, eliminating federal expenditure, ending mandatory investment, ending the Fed. Those four to me, I won't call them unrealistic, but to me, they're just so distant right now based on what we currently have to work with right now that um, it's, it's just such a task, I think. Um, th there just has to be so much else that has to be laid down for those things to, to be more of a reality. As, as far as what we were saying before, I think the issue I have is, um, like I said, the ideological stuff, I don't think I'm going to change when it comes to that. But I, I think your question is was a little bit too simplistic because my issue is the government versus corporation aspect because 
I think we live in a time where people have a hard time understanding what the government function is and what the corporation's function is because that relationship is so intertwined. And that's the issue I have. I don't know what the intentions of the corporation is. I don't know what the government's intention is because it seems like they need each other to kind of exist. And and that's why it's hard to understand because just like with the bailouts in 08, it was a prime example. Everyone kept saying, the, the mainstream media, all the politicians, all the talking heads in Washington, these companies are too big to fail. And I'm saying to myself, that's crazy. That concept is too big to fail. And then and then I think it creates this environment where working people are like, okay, well, I might as well get something from the process if corporations are going to get all these breaks and stuff. I might as well get something out of it. And I think that's the, the kind of thing that's it is probably contributed to my, maybe my mindset even more. Um not to say that it's right and wrong, but I think it, it has a lot to do. Those types of occurrences have contributed to that type of thought process. I agree with you. You should be skeptical of the relationship between government and corporations. Uh, certainly at the local level, if the government is making public funds available to private schools, you know that those monies are going to come with strings attached. That's a bad look, a bad attitude, a bad way to do business and a bad structure. So I look forward to the day when we get public financing out of it completely. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. You should be skeptical about who is making these stupid decisions about bailing out major corporations, major banks, because someone alleges that they're too big to fail. If they are too big to fail, then someone should have ordered them to have been broken up a long time ago. Personally, I do not believe that we have an institution in the United States that is too big to allow it to fail. And I would send that signal, as I believe any libertarian-minded administration in the White House should send the signal that we are not going to allow a bank to be bailed out for any reason, least of all because of its size, that if you are investing in a bank because you believe that that bank will never be allowed to fail because the government is backing it up, this is your warning. You might want to rethink your investment strategy because we are not going to allow the Treasury Department and we are going to change the regulatory environment inside the Federal Reserve System so that major banks are not bailed out. They are not going to be bailed out uh, pursuant to federal regulation. They're not going to be bailed out with taxpayer money. They are going to be allowed to fail. And if that means breaking them up on the way down, fine. If that means that people are going to have to take a haircut on the money that they're owed, fine. I don't have a problem with the banks getting together and creating the FDIC. I do believe the FDIC should be fully privatized already. It relies on private sector money. The idea that the federal government uses it to regulate banks is complete bogus. Uh, it's private sector uh, money. I don't have a problem that the FDIC exists, right, to protect uh, depositors. But if you're investing money in a bank, not as a depositor, you need to find a way to hold that bank accountable because it could fail. Mm. I tell you what, Mike, on that note, I know we got time constraints, but um, I do want to give you like a minute or two to um, leave any final words for my audience. And again, um, I've enjoyed this conversation. We're probably going to have some more down the road. Um, there's just so much more I want to discuss, but you know, sometimes the time doesn't allow it. But I still think we had a great episode 103. I'm excited to play this back um, later on. This episode will be released today on Kiko's Free Thing, former official YouTube channel. But I just want to say thanks to you, Mike, for coming back onto the show, accepting the invitation. And um, if you want to leave in the final words for my audience. Well, thank you. I think that we've covered what you wanted to cover, and, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to do so and answer your questions. If folks would like to learn more about our campaign, they can go to MikeTremont.com. That's a little tricky for some folks to spell, of course, because there's two A's in Tremont. Easier might be to go to the, the website representing the platform itself, goldnewdeal.org. Those two websites flip back and forth and connect to each other. So you can see everything about the campaign there. 
and you can explore the artificial intelligence bot when it comes back up as well. Kiko, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for letting me spend this time with you and with your audience. It's been uh, a great pleasure as it is each and every time. Absolutely. And um, again, I have so many more questions, but we have to stay there for another time. Uh, beautiful people. Uh, this has been a great episode 103. Um, we're joined by Brittany Jones in episode 104. Um, we have Jay Clark coming up next week um, to discuss um, more hip hop culture. We're going to talk about uh, P. Diddy, the, the allegations against him. There's just so much going on in the world of hip hop and the music industry. We have the People's Party of Texas coming up on Saturday. We have my friend Matthew Witt tomorrow discussing Charles Mills, who was a philosopher. Um, we're going to talk about some class, some race dynamics. Just We have all types of people coming on. We got Jill Stein coming on later in this month. We got Norm Finkelstein coming on. Just um, all types of people lined up, probably 20 interviews lined up um, within a few weeks' time. Just um, a lot for one person to be responsible for, but I'm not complaining about it. Regardless, I'll tell your friends and family to subscribe to us for free. Um, we appreciate all of our guests. And um, again, Mike has always been a great, consistent guest, accept our invitations graciously. And um, beautiful people, enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, everybody.